Right, GMBN podcast number 13. And because we're in the thick of the Tour de France, thought let's talk about road bikes. We've got Cy Richardson. Hello. Uh, Cy from GCN, but obviously a, well, I was going to say a former mountain biker, but you still ride, don't you? That's it, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a mountain bike all the time at the minute, but I don't get paid to ride my mountain bike anymore. That, that finished <laughs> a number of years ago. So what, you raced, you raced junior to a high level, you raced world champs junior and then turned elite? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I raced uh, as a full-time bike rider. I was paid by the national team for five years. I rode for Subaru Gary Fisher, if anyone remembers them oh, yeah. from back in the day. And uh, my last official mountain bike race was the Fort William World Champs in 2007. Right. So uh, cross-country. Do I need to stress that? Yeah, cross-country <laughs> rider through and through. Well, I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about the tour, road racing, how it crosses over for mountain biking. Because we have seen it a bit in the past. And I'm, there's a lot of mountain bikes like myself who are sort of um, casual road bike fans. So I ride a road bike a fair amount, but also I like to keep track of the big races like the Tour. And we're into, is it the last week now? Yeah, that's right. And if anyone is has a passing interest in the Tour de France, this is the year to get involved because it's, it's widely being seen as one of the best Tour de France's we've had in decades it's brilliant it's absolutely poised on a knife edge and why is that just because it's not as predictable as the old sky years of knowing what's going to happen well there is a little bit of that i mean um you can if you've got the best team and the best riders you can pretty much ensure that you're going to win there's always like pitfalls and and potential disasters waiting around every corner like mountain bikers jumping over the peloton that kind of recipe for disaster i was going to talk about that it, it, i don't like it it winds me up it feels like we're like the the younger brother and like look at me look at me every year I'm like, it's kind of pointless <laughs> well i think it's kind of cool my my worry is that like one year it's going to go wrong it will do yeah. because like at the moment it seems like it's pretty good riders doing it and you're like yeah okay and then at some point there's going to be some complete chopper who jumps it and then lands in the pro peloton so you know yeah it's one of those things like let's stop it now before it goes disastrously wrong yeah it makes me think the road the road riders are probably just cringing thinking oh here we go this is the guy this year is it let's <laughs> yeah basically yeah oh well um but what about sort of uh in the past cross-country races go moving on to the road i know you did it why did you do it let's start with that well uh two reasons really uh the first one, the unavoidable one, is that my time on the British cycling team is coming to an end. I clearly wasn't going to be as good as they needed me to be in order to keep funding me. Um, I was never going to win an Olympic medal, and that was becoming clear at the age of like 22, 23. I wasn't improving enough. Um, and then, and so I, I, yeah, basically I needed to find a job. And so <laughs> Pro Peloton on the road uh, was, a, was a pretty good uh, place to go. But actually, as a, as a mountain biker, I've been buying you know, road cycling magazines for years. Like, you know, I was always looked up to, to roadies. It looked, you know, looked good fun. It was kind of like glamorous. It didn't have to clean my bike as much. Um, so, so yeah, I'd always wanted to do it and I dabbled a bit for training. So when I was, when I was mountain biking, I'd do the odd road race and I loved it. Um, partly because it was a break, you know, it wasn't what I was getting paid to do. So it felt like it was just fun um, as well as being good training, really. And there must be, for the really high level riders like, people like Cadell Evans have done it. There must be the draw of money because obviously road cycling is just bigger. So there's going to be a bigger paycheck if you're at the, the top end of that race. And so that must draw out some of the mountain bikers as well, I suppose. Yeah, big time. And actually, funnily enough, you go way back in time when mountain biking, uh, cross-country mountain biking was in its heyday and there were some big, big paychecks. Mm -hmm. You had an influx of roadies came over. So any old people out there might remember people like Christophe Dupuy, Jerome Ciotti. Uh, yeah, yeah. Infamously, they brought doping with them actually for a time, um, but they came over because they were they were okay road riders, and then they came over to mountain biking. And funnily enough, when you take an EPO and you're a good roadie, they were absolutely killing it. Yeah, there was some of those years. Who were we talking about before? Was it Rasmussen? Yeah, people, those sort of early was that 2000s, late 90s. Well, yeah. So Rasmussen came was kind of overlapped with those guys, and then but he was a mountain biker first and foremost. Did he win the worlds in '99? Maybe I think he did. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then he transitioned over to the road so he was one of those mountain bikers that, yeah. that did really well on the road and he ultimately was looking like he was going to win the tour de france and then he uh, got embroiled in a doping scandal all of his own but it, it doesn't seem to happen so much now the sort of crossover of mountain bikers get into the highest level and then go into the road um cross country has changed it's gone from those two hours plus races down to an hour and a half now and you see the shape of the riders now uh 
like Nino Schurter and, you know, even Sam Gaze is a big, muscly dude. You, you look at them compared to road riders and think maybe it isn't so easy for them to just swap over. I know Nino did do some racing, I think, for Orica Green Edge, maybe the Swiss. He did, Porter yeah, Swiss. 2014. Uh, yeah. And didn't do all that well. No, yeah. I mean, he did, you know, he was fine, but but no, it wasn't like... Um, if you go back to Cadell Evans, who well, she was never world cross-country champion, uh, nor even Olympic champ, he won World Cups for a couple of years. You yeah. know, one of the best mountain bikers <laughs> of his generation. And he transitioned straight over onto the road and nearly won the Tour of Italy at his first attempt. He then took uh, nearly a decade to win the Tour de France, but he was, you know, his his ability as a mountain biker transitioned straight across. Mm-hmm. And then we've seen it subsequently with guys like Jakob Fuglsang, who's currently launching around the top 10 of the Tour de France, really successful roadie, was under 23 mountain bike, world champ. So so it definitely, it used to be, you're right, that cross-country mountain biking was a great predictor of road form. Whereas now, as you say, like mat, cross-country mountain biking has changed, it's shorter, it's punchier. I don't think those guys are focusing on their kind of threshold so the, the the speed, the intensity they can ride for an hour. And so they, although they're still amazing athletes, like Vanderpool being a prime example, you know, yeah. winning road cross and mountain bike. Um <laughs> and so so yeah, I think I think they probably would struggle to to at least win the Tour de France. You know, yeah. they could definitely do it. But so I'm literally still aching from uh, a training session I did on Friday. So that was four days ago now with Nino Schurter, myself and Blake. We're lucky enough to be invited over to Switzerland and take part, you know, watch what he does on one of his days in the gym and take part. And it was really impressive and very inspiring. But yeah, it's a kind of, you look at what the road riders do now and I don't expect many of them spend as much time in the gym as Nino does. But his his morning session that we did was a circuit session that was really, really difficult, actually sort of skills-wise to do what he was doing, never mind the physicality of it. You sort of standing on balance balls with kettlebells and moving them around and doing squats. And it was all, you can see how it was all really related to riding mountain bikes. So lots of sort of asymmetrical movements, and his uh, recovery in between those circuits, calls it cognitive recovery, I think, was standing on a balance ball and juggling or on basically ver- different sort of balancing things. So you can see how it was really related to riding bikes. And then we did max squats. So five reps of three uh, max squats in the gym, followed by uh, jumps. So really explosive movements. And then the afternoon was VO2 max intervals on the bike. So it was like a five minute up a hill at you know your virtually your threshold. And then a minute on a really technical downhill track, three minutes off, and then doing that over again. So six of those. So it was a big day out on the bike. That does sound brutal. Literally, all my muscles are aching. It definitely wasn't just my legs. Like, you know, my triceps, my core is killing after doing that. So it was, it was quite interesting that he was he's really open with it as well, willing to show us what he does, but such a whole body workout that I can't imagine many road riders doing that sort of workout. Anyway. No, I can't imagine many mountain bikers doing that sort of workout either. And I don't know whether it's because you know, it's that it's just, it works specifically for Nino. Although it looks from, from her Instagram, like Kate Courtney, his teammate and yeah. know, fellow world champ, that she does that kind of stuff a lot. I think so. Um, but, uh, but no, it, you know, I'd be, be interested to know how many other cross country mountain bikers either do it or start to do it. But no, it, you certainly wouldn't get the impression that that would help as a road rider. No way. Sagan does quite a lot of funky stuff in the gym. You, again, you see that on his Instagram every now and then. Yeah. But I think it's very much tailored in the off season. You know, it's not yeah. like, the morning before Tour de France stage, you're going to be doing like cognitive recovery or whatever, yeah. anything like that. So if Schurter was to decide to go to road, could he compete at a tour? Would he? Where would he sit in a tour? Well, the funny thing about road racing for, for mountain bikes, you maybe don't know that much about it, is that you can, there are so many different jobs to do, so many different roles as a pro cyclist, pro road cyclist. So you've obviously got the kind of 15 or so riders that are trying to win the race overall, but then there's 180 other riders in the race. So some of those other riders are literally going to be supporting the people that are trying to win. So that we call them domestiques. So they'll be getting everything from fetching them water from the team cars to sheltering from the wind, all that kind of stuff. But then you've also got riders that can win or perform well in other aspects of the tour. So you've got the sprinters. And so you maybe got like 15 of those who could potentially win a flat stage of the tour. And so all they have to do is is hide from the wind, save as much energy as possible until the last 200 metres of a stage when they absolutely gun it. So they're your Peter Sagan's, your Cavendishes. Exactly. And Mark Cavendish, Peter Sagan, prime examples. So they, you know, 
they're, they're very good at going up hills. They don't look like it all the time compared to the guys that are amazing at going up hills. But, you know, they'd leave any one of us for dead any day of the week. Um, and then you've also got these kind of other stages that aren't mountain stages. They're not sprint stages. They're kind of like hilly stages, if you like. Mm. And that's the kind of stage where you think a rider like Nino might immediately fit in because you've got to be quite explosive to get in the breakaway. You've got to be explosive to go up the hills and then you've got to be able to win the stage as well. But yeah, I can't imagine him riding up outdoors or the Col de Tourmalet and, you know, and winning that stage. I just don't think he's got the engine at the minute for that. So you, your sprinters going back a step, would they, they'd use the domestics as well, would they? In the day? Yeah. So on, you rarely see a team with an out and out sprinter and a GC guy. Okay. Well. So in that, so, for example, Team Ineos, so formerly Team Sky, they they have once had a sprinter at the Tour de France, Cavendish, but it didn't work that well. So their, their team is entirely built around riders who are good on the flat and can shelter their team, but then they've also got climbing domestiques. So riders that could probably win stages of their own and finishing the top 10 yeah. are then paid to look after the guys that are going to win the race. Whereas a team that's built around a a sprinter will have more bigger dudes who are good at riding at sixty five k's an hour on the flat, yeah. and you know it's not it's not completely clear cut. There are teams that have got both and are doing well at both, okay. but but generally, if you're going to put all your eggs in one basket, it's it's either or. So where would Nino sit? He would potentially be a domestique that could win a hilly stage, so he'd have to work for someone else the rest of the tour, but could be one of those riders that jumped away on an unusual. Stage. Yeah, I think so. Like you wouldn't, he's not a big enough rider to sort of like be a domestic on the flat. And he's also too good for that. I don't think you can go from being one of the greatest mountain guys <laughs> yeah. of all time to just being a it's guy that ferries though. water bottles. But but yeah, I don't I couldn't see him performing on an out and out mountain stage. Although that said, you know, if you don't if we'd had this conversation three weeks ago, I'd have said there's a rider called Julian Alaphilippe who's currently in yeah. the yellow jersey. And I'd have said Nino has a kind of similar characteristic to him, really punchy, explosive, you know, amazing top end. And but then I said, you know, no real chance of winning the race overall. But Alaphilippe currently looks like he might win the Tour de France overall. So it's it's not to say that Nino couldn't win the tour, it's just that he wouldn't at the moment. So what we've got? Probably six days left of the tour, is it? Uh, hang on a minute. Tuesday to Sunday. Yeah, is that six days? We've got one more rest day, I think. Haven't we? That's today. That's today. So, and we're going into the Alps. So, does it look likely that Alaphilippe could win? Uh, well, so he, like I said, at the beginning of the tour, there's no way, mm. but he has shown that he's definitely taken a big step on. So, he's able to, to now climb with the best riders. He has, however, had a really tough start to the tour. He's a really explosive, aggressive rider. So you wouldn't normally see someone that was looking to take the yellow jersey into Paris attacking off the front of the bunch as he did on stage three, where he ended up winning a stage because you use a lot of energy that way without actually getting that much back. And it's energy that you would then be relying on in the final week. You've kind of got... That we talk about the analogy is like you've got like a, a box of matches and if you start yeah. burning them all too early in the tour then you get to the final week where you need some matches and you haven't got any left so Alaphilippe did have a slight wobble yesterday where he lost some time for the first time in this year's race and so now everyone's just trying to weigh out well can he recover on the rest day and then be okay in this final week of the tour but it's a big week you know we've got like yeah. epic mountains the race goes higher than it's gone for for years so it's all to play for. Still. It is all to play for, and he's got his work cut out. <laughs> it's funny, I raced only one day of the BC bike race last week, or a couple of weeks ago now, actually. And uh, I just did it for a video, but I was hoping to do the whole race and couldn't work out my schedules. But I sort of jumped in mid-pack, so 600 riders, I jumped in probably about 300th and finished 150th. So obviously those riders are, are four days, uh, you know, four days fatigued. So I'm jumping in where I'm feeling pretty fresh. And did okay, obviously not brilliantly, but did okay. But obviously I'm riding against people who are really tired. And the next day we went to shoot some more videos and my legs were killing me, where I felt like, you know, doing that back to back, I I burnt too many matches on that one day. So it's, it's such a hard thing to be able to do. And I can't imagine a grand tour where you're doing it for three weeks. No, I mean, one one thing that that I, I would never forget from my mountain bike days is how much easier it felt racing on the road, which isn't to say that I stopped mountain bike and I suddenly won every race going. I certainly didn't. But to actually complete a road race 
is easier than completing a, a cross country mountain bike race because right. cross country mountain bike you're always going full gas 100 yeah. percent. whereas on the road there are you know parts of stages or entire days even when you when you're chilling now the tour de france is different it's the pinnacle of the sport it's it's brutal completing that is is a massive achievement in itself mm. but as a road rider, you can race a lot more because it, it doesn't take as much out of you. I don't think your muscles are as beaten up at the end of a stage. Right. And and mentally as well, because you, there's not always the pressure to do your best. You're either there collecting water bottles for your team or, mm. you know, you can do a job, as I said, and not actually have that job be ultimately getting a result for yourself. So it's, it's definitely not comparable. I think a mountain bike stage race is harder. There's no way you could do a 21 stage cape epic for example i don't think what's been great uh from the mountain bikes perspective i think is to see matthew vanderpool jump over and be one of the biggest stars of cycling in total and jumping over and looking like he's really enjoying it and winning races uh, short track especially he's doing really well um it's cool to see someone sort of be so honest to really show their hand in everything they do and we don't see that so much anymore but also I actually asked Nino, well, I asked Nino if he was friends with Matthew. He said, well, I'm not friends, but we, you know, we're friendly. And I asked him about his, you know, what he's doing basically. And Nino seemed to think that it was brilliant, but sort of unsustainable because he races so much. Yeah. Um, you know, Cross is obviously massive for him. And he, re- did he win the Amstel Gold? Yeah, he did, yeah. Um, and then jumped straight into racing cross country. And I think he's missed, did he miss one or two World Cups? But other than that, he's been flat out racing. Very impressive to see. But what do you think are his intentions in the future? Where do you see him going? I think he'll probably end up going to the Tour de France and be full-time on the road. Like I say, or like Nino said, I don't think you can juggle that much, especially not when you're doing grand tours. So these three-week stage races, they just take it out of you too much. You're gonna, you can't go from that to a mountain bike race. Um, but I totally agree with you. I think it's fantastic what he's doing. He looks just looks like he loves riding his bike no matter what yeah. it is and i also thought how cool it was that the amstel gold road race that he won it was possibly one of the most dominant displays of road riding i've seen ever and then pretty much was it a week later where he didn't win the mountain bike world cup and i remember thinking like that makes <laughs> yeah. mountain bike look so hard that he's yeah. just made the best road rides in the world look average and then suddenly, you know, he hasn't managed to just completely dominate the mountain bike World Cup. So on the one hand, you can see how different it is. On the other hand, you can see how competitive cross-country mountain biking still is. Yeah. And I, But I do think that with Vanderpool, he will have to specialise in road if he wants to kind of fulfil his talent there. At some in point. In stage races at yeah. least, yeah. I think it's looking like he's doing Tokyo 2020 mountain biking. So Nino's going to have a fight in his hands for that one, yeah. for sure. Uh, and then, yeah, we kind of presume he'll be going straight from there to racing road yeah but i mean he's a talent like like no other i mean you've kind of yeah he's he's a once in a generation if not you know exactly more than that because he's really good as well you look at the photos of him doing jumps and he rides motocross all sorts of stuff really good and again after following nino down the downhill track you know last week you have to be such a good technical rider to be winning these races yeah and what amazed me, we did those intervals going up the hill and then our sort of recovery was riding back down a really steep, gnarly downhill track. But then to try and think about racing down there and over, potentially overtaking people, I, I couldn't get my head around that part of it. Where, yeah. you know, it's such a, an all-round sort of physical and technical thing to be able to do that, you know, I think Vanderpool and Nino are, are the best at doing that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we've been talking about on GCN a little bit is is how cool it would be if there was like an overall title for the world's best all-round cyclist. Yeah. So you have like your cyclocross, you have your road racing and you have your mountain biking in there as well because we've seen it on the women's side, Pauline ferrand Prevo, she yeah. was concurrent world champ in all three disciplines. Yeah. And then, you know, you've got guys like Sagan that has been a world junior mountain bike champ. I think he was up there in the world junior cyclocross champs as well you know but how good would it be if you could somehow incentivize these riders to do a matchy vanderpool take yeah. a bit of time out of the sport that they're paid you know properly for i don't know how you do it i'm, I'm the only way i can think of is like the paycheck and you can imagine yeah. vanderpools must be the canyon top rider yeah because they're paying him to ride everything but yeah I, it would be a really cool thing to be able to see, wouldn't it? Just, I, I mean, you just need a you just need a rider with the confidence of a Vanderpool or a Sagan who's just like, you know what, I'm gonna do this man bar race, or I'm gonna do this road <laughs> yeah. race, and yeah, I just, that'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? Because that's the debate. It's like, how how do they 
transfer across. What about the technical skills on the road? You do see it in descending, but does that make a big enough difference in these grand tours to, you know, if you're really good at descending, it will make the difference? It can do. You wouldn't you wouldn't say like the tour is always one on downhills, but... What about that Froome thing where he dropped onto the top tube? Didn't oh, he? man. Well, that's insane. Well, actually, Froome's an interesting example because Froome used to be a rubbish bike handler. Froome was awful, but he's obviously worked on it yeah. and now is is really quite strong at descending. Thibaut Pino's another one. He was rubbish and now he's top five and potentially going to win this, his race. For me, the, the mountain bike skills come out when you see a rider who is about to crash. Yeah. You know, in, when you see like the whole peloton go down, is how a rider responds. So Sagan's really good at that. Yeah. He never just grabs his brakes and closes his eyes. You know, he'll always look for the way out, whether it's, you know, bunny hopping someone's bike or, you know, going into a field and riding around it. He's always, his first thought is not just to grab onto the brakes, it's to do something else. And that's a mountain bike thing, isn't it? Like, you know, yeah. in, in times of peril, actually having your brakes full on isn't always the best <laughs> answer. Sometimes you've got to let them go and ride it out. Whereas uh, someone like Garen Thomas the other day got caught up in a crash and you can see from this photograph that he's sending it over the bars and he hasn't hit anything. Like there's nothing in front yeah, of him. He's I've literally just launching it over the bars because he's obviously panicked. <sighs> and, you know, no disrespect to Garen at all because he's a brilliant bike rider as yeah. well as a really lovely bloke. But he does sometimes seem to fall off more than his fair share. Mm. And I looked at that photo and I just wondered whether or not that was that was an explanation of why he falls off a lot. It's because instead of looking for the way around and you know taking the mountain bike option, bunny hopping on the curb, whatever, he's literally just gone, oh god, and <laughs> breaks on, sends it over the bars, and yeah. fortunately there was a Pinarello to land on, and actually he escaped unhurt. But uh, well, we saw it with uh, Blake riding with Jeremy Powers, obviously a brilliant bike rider. I think obviously riding a, a drop bar bike around a muddy field does make you a good bike handler. Unfortunately, we saw Van Art hit the barriers Ooh. and have a really nasty injury. From yeah, that. and he's obviously a very good rider, but. That was on the time trial, wasn't it? So blowing, it, you would expect. Yeah, I think with that one, he like there was a there was a dodgy barrier basically that was kind of uh, sticking out, and he was so committed and going so fast. I just I just think it was one of those things where the barrier stuck out. He wasn't expecting it, and I think it just took him out. Yeah, shame um, to see him not make the end of the race. Oh, awful, awful to see. Yeah, especially when you hear about like you know surgery to his upper thigh. Mm. Right? Um, I can empathise with that. Yeah, yeah, there you can. Um, <laughs> But yeah, he's another one where you'd think, oh, actually, having said that, in Paris Bay, he just fell off on a corner as well. Oh, right. Not to say that his, his bike handling skills are, are lacking, but. Um, well, we saw Lancey Boy ride through a cornfield. That's right. Time. And, uh, you know, former top five in North American mountain bike cross country races. Races, is it, is it the level? Level 100, I think he races. Yeah, he does, yeah. Yeah, I think he's actually just like. He's an example of someone that used to be a triathlete and can actually ride a bike, yeah. uh, which is, you know, there's, there's not many of them knocking around. Uh, but yeah, I think he spent a lot of time riding riding mountain bikes and, and that helps. It might just be like a, like an instinctive thing, but I, it, you can't help but think, well, actually, yeah, being able to, you know, yeah. get your way out of situations is pretty important. Get some of these roadies on a mountain bike boot camp then, maybe on the in the off-season. Well, they do try. Some uh, okay. some of the pro teams will do like an off-road boot camp. And it's quite funny because <laughs> you like, to like see it. some guys are rubbish, absolutely <laughs> rubbish. Uh, but then there are more people that have spent, you know, spent their like formative years mountain biking than, you, than you'd think. Like, there's, a, there's a big oh, old sure. list, yeah, yeah, of top, top uh, roadies that have mountain biked. And if I was going to say to someone, you know, how to get into road racing, 100%, I'd say do everything when you're a kid, mountain bike, cyclocross, road, yeah. the whole lot. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thanks, Si. Good chat. And I'm looking forward to the last week of the tour. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do make sure you check it out. Can I just, can I give a quick plug? We've yeah, got go highlights every day on the GCN Racing YouTube channel. Excellent. So, uh, so yeah, you only have to watch five minutes a day and you know everything there is to know about the Tour de France. Great. Cheers, Si. All right, man. I'm no sure. worries.